Thank you very much for your um, your uh, for inviting me to talk to you on this subject. I'm also going to take uh, a, a historical view of the situation that we're in in the United Kingdom, but I'm going to focus on economics and finance, and especially banks and financial markets. Uh, I think in the past two decades, finance has become a much more powerful and contentious force in the world. Uh, I mean, one can think, for example, of the weaponization of finance through the unprecedented financial sanctions being deployed against Russia today, or the emerging battle uh, between the United States and China over which currency is going to become more power powerful, and powerful and influential in, uh, in the world. Alongside finance, there are, of course, plenty of other powerful forces at work in the world. We've got a conventional war going on in Europe. Uh, since the turn of the century, technology has unpredictably altered the structure of corporate, corporate, the corporate sector in the world. I mean, there are companies now, major uh, companies which did not exist 10, 20 years ago, Facebook, uh, Amazon in the US, uh, Alibaba and Tencent in, the, you know, in, in China. We've obviously seen the, the rise of a pop populist president in, in uh, the United States, Trump, and it's no wonder seeing what he his attitudes and policies that European policymakers are worried stiff that he might win the, the re-election next year. But in focusing on economics and finance nationally and internationally, I, I want to focus also on the impact which finance is having on society and not just on global politics. Because I think often finance is such an abstruse topic that uh, people pay very little attention to it. But at this point uh, in history, the International Finance, uh, uh, or the Institute for International Finance in Washington is say, is, is, has noted that this, the world economy, the world economy has never before been so dangerously indebted, $300 trillion worth of debt floating around the world economy at the moment. And whatever problems this debt uh, explosion might cause over the next five or ten or fifteen years. Um, it's clear that one of the one of the, the buildup of this debt has made uh, financiers more influential and bankers more influential. And I want to highlight the way that some of the ways that has functioned, but also highlight in particular the economic, the changing economic and financial ideas and theories which ha have led to the that that increase in indebtedness and and uh, the challenges they pose at the moment. I will suggest that in the past century, three different dominant economic financial theories have shaped the world in which we live. Each influenced economic policy making uh, and national and global policy choices, each for about two or three decades, e each individual po um, policy stance. Today, we are now looking at what might prove to be another transformation in global and national economic policy thinking. And so in the political choices we make here in the UK and which other nations may make. But I, I want to start this presentation in a rather odd place with a couple of quotations from Reinhold Niebuhr, an eminent American theologian. And these books are taken, these quotes, I'm sorry, are taken from his book, Moral Man and Immoral Society, which was published in 1932. In this book, Niebuhr writes, quote, when collective power in society, whether in the form of imperialism or class domination, exploits weakness, it can never be dislodged unless power is raised against it. On the face of it, this could be read as the introduction to a book about class war, but Niebuhr was a theologian and certainly not a Marxist. Essentially, what his book says is that nations or classes or groups in a society, big and small, do not have the same degree of moral restraint as the individuals that make up those groups. As a result, the dominant forces in society can and do impose their will selfishly on weaker groups to a degree that individuals with their moral inhibitions generally do not. He notes in his book, for example, the immense power of, at that time, of the military caste in Japan. He was writing, of course, as I said, in 1932, just as Adolf Hitler was creating a dominant force in Germany, the National Socialist or Nazi Party. 
These organizations' power was not based on social class, but they ruthlessly exploited the weakness of other groups in societies. He was writing too, and this is more apposite, I suspect, to this audience and to our current positions. Uh, he was writing too, as the evidence of the greed and selfishness of what were then the dominant forces in the United States, the business and financial elites, was also being exposed. As Niebuhr's as Niebuhr's book was published, the great crash of 1929 and the subsequent great depression of the 1930 were simultaneously exposing the way in which to use Niebuhr's terminology, a dominant class of wealthy industrialist financiers had been exploiting the weakness of a disjointed proletariat or working class and a feeble, actually the US government was quite feeble then on a national level of a feeble government. The appalling aftermath of this economic exploitation of workers' weaknesses was on display then in every city, town, and village across the United States. Unemployment, for example, averaged around 20% in the whole decade of the 1930s. Charitable soup kitchens, and we'll come back to this issue of charitable food later, provided food for millions. The US also helped tip the, tip the world economy into a crisis, contributing to the outbreak of the Second World War. But, and this is my, the first point at which I identify a, a, a significant change in, uh, in the, the zeitgeist, the economic zeitgeist, if you want. Uh, that's a rather pretentious word, but you'd probably know, all know what it means. The Great Crash and the Great Depression, however, also brought an end to the dominance of, laissez -faire, of the laissez-faire economic concepts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These had rested on the idea that minimal government involvement in business was an essential element in, an eco in a nation's economic success. The, but there was a dramatic response to the emerging Great Depression by President Franklin D. Roosevelt with his New Deal legislation. And this demonstrated that government could and should play a more active role in shaping the economy and so society. Roosevelt was relying on his political instincts to restructure the economic policy role of the US government, but at the same time, a brilliant British economist, John Maynard Keynes, was introducing the intellectual foundations, the ideas to underpin FDR's political in instincts and ensure that they endured. Keynes' economic theory that an activist state, not a passive one, was needed in order to fight unemployment and stabilize the economy took root. So with FDR, a new era of economic policy began. A laissez-faire was buried, and the Keynesian era of activist government was launched. The years from 1932 to 1980, when Keynes, Keynesian ideas dominated economic policy making, are interesting, for they, they are the only period which I can identify in the past century during which, to return to Niebuhr's insight, the power of what might be called the working class was sufficiently well organized to dislodge the then dominant class of industrial financiers. But by 1980, the Keynesian activist economic government's model was also in the process of being tested to destruction. Its most influential advisors had been ignorant or ambitious policy, politicians seeking to manipulate the economy in the short term, to, put, to boost their popularity and their election prospects, and short-sighted politically motivated trade unionists battling for an ever bigger share of the national pie. I should also mention that some of them taught me, Nicholas Calder, for example, at Cambridge was a, an avid Keynesian. Uh, and while I was studying economics at Cambridge, there was very little discussion of any economic model apart from the Keynesian model in the, the, in the lectures I, I attended. But together in the US, uh, these changes helped the, the, the Keynesian, the way that the use to which the Keynesian models was, was, was put by politicians and trade unionists and academics uh, contributed it to driving US inflation past the, in the US, past the politically intolerable level of 10%, which in turn triggered a crash in the US, US dollar. Uh, a, a very much underestimated pillar of American global power then, and I would argue still. The situation, of course, was worse in the UK, where inflation soared to close to 24% in 1975. 
But, but by this time, a counter-revolution, a, res a rejection of Keynesian orthodoxy had also gaining credence. Business, big and small, conservative politicians and economists like Milton Friedman had despaired of the expansive role government had taken in shaping the economy. They were able to argue, partly on the basis of the inflationary blowout, that it was time to again get government out of business and set the entrepreneurial class free. By 1980, these conservative business leaders, politicians and economists in the US and the UK had found in President Ronald Reagan and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the political leaders uh, of their counter-revolution. From, from Reagan and Thatcher's elections until the year of the great financial crisis in 2007, free market, laissez-faire, so-called neoliberal theories and, and, and dogma again ruled the economic roost. After 1980, so therefore, it was about 27, 27 years of monetary policy became the dominant economic policy instrument. Fiscal or tax policy was focused on getting taxes down, not deployed primarily to act, actively manage the economy. Controls, are, as you will know all of these, but let me go through it quickly. Controls on business freedoms on both sides of the Atlantic were eased or removed, including the deliberate erosion of workers' rights through their trade unions to fight for better wages. Most importantly, or one of the most important things I, I think happened in this era, not widely commented on and too readily accepted, uh, banking and finance were also set free from legal constraints, especially from the early 1990s onwards. Under Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the United Kingdom also adopted pro-business policies and rejected the idea that an interventionist government was needed to promote growth and stability. But... Just as at the great crash in 1929 signaled the, signaled the end of an era when finance and business had succeeded in strictly limiting government involvement in their affairs and elevating the power of the, the, the financial and industrial elites. So the great inflation of the 70s helped to expose the failure of allegedly Keynesian economic policies. The great financial crash of, and, and then the great financial crash of 2007 and eight demonstrated once again that laissez-faire economic policies, particularly wholesale deregulation of financial markets, was also a recipe for, inter, in, for, for economic disaster. So where are we now? There is, first of all, precious little evidence, and I've looked at a lot of it, I can't quote it all here, of any dramatic improvement in the long-term economic growth performance of the US or the UK economies as a result of the ideological trampoline on which transatlantic economic policymakers have bounced for the past century. The same, but the same can be said of the UK's economic performance, especially since the Conservative government exited the European Union. Let me just, I haven't written this, so let me just say this in parentheses. If you look at the German economic model, it did not, it, it, it was not bounced around from one side to the other by, on, on ideological grounds. Businessmen and the government and the trade unions took a long-term, rather cautious uh, view of how the economy should, should be managed and essentially a consensual view. Uh, but in, in this country, in the United States, in the United Co Kingdom, inequality during this period of ideology, this ideological trampoline period, which, which I've discussed, inequality in, both, in, in the, both the United States and the United Kingdom has been increasing over decades. Much discussion here focuses on, focuses on income inequality, but wealth inequality is also very, very important. In the US in particular, easier access, sorry, in the UK in particular, easier access to finance has undoubtedly contributed to house price bubbles, which have made house owners, house owners steadily richer. This has disadvantaged not only the millions of poorer citizens who do not own their homes, Younger people who, in British parlance, cannot get on the housing ladder, in itself a re revealing phrase, are also disadvantaged. In the UK, it is not just the, the wealth of poorer citizens which has been hit, but also their health. Several studies, particularly reports by Sir Mark, Michael Marmot, notably his 2010 report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, had no, have noted and highlighted the link between poverty and poor health. Uh, that's also been brought up again regularly recently, including today uh, with this uh, discussion about a, a slimming pill. 
This link is now being, this link between health and, 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 and wealth, or adverse link between health and wealth, this link is now being made even more pernicious by the fast deteriorating effectiveness of the National Health Service. This is leading wealthier people to turn increasingly to the private sector for medical attention. Meanwhile, even underpaid NHS and private care home staff are, according to numerous media reports, having to rely on their version of soup kitchens, if you'll permit me, notably the food banks, which are scattered all over this country, prolif proliferate all over this country. When vital workers in full-time jobs have to resort to charities for food, society's cohesion is at risk. In Niebuhr's terminology, surely there can be no clearer sign of the exploitation of a weaker group or class in society by the collective power of another group. But there is now mounting evidence that in the UK, this is about to change. The weaker social group are becoming stronger. In short, the failure of the neoliberal pro-business ideology to deliver higher living standards for the British people over at least the past decade is now a powerful force which is undermining the political appeal of both the economic theory and the Conservative Party, which so selfishly and naive, naive, the, the neoliberal economic theory, which the Conservative Party uh, so selfishly and naively embraced. So too, opinion polls now suggest, is the self-destructive hard exit from the European Union, especially the damage this is doing to one of the few jewels, if you'll forgive me, in the United Kingdom economic crown, its globally focused financial se service sector, a sector which has uh, a, a political weight out of all balance to its, the, its importance to the economy or to the society. The fact that around the world, governments are now having to become much more actively involved with business for geopolitical reasons is also fundamentally altering the economic policy debate. Government activism, notably in the field of so-called industrial policy, is rising up every government's agenda. Such a policy includes promoting some business sectors to ensure vital raw materials or component supplies, semiconductors most obviously, and defending others for national security reasons. Inexorably, this too is undermining the neoliberal market ideology. The economic cold war that has engulfed the United States and China is also forcing governments and businesses to think hard about how they negotiate what is a deglobalizing world economy. So today, flexibility and pragmatism, not inflexibility and ideology, and an appeal to narrow nationalism are the essential elements of both economic and security policy. This has posed a challenge to the United States, but wisely under President Joe Biden, it is already becoming more collegial. The United States is becoming more collegial in its management of the Western alliance. For the United Kingdom, the lesson is clear. Hug your neighbors closer. In a much more dangerous and economically and politically challenging world, a medium-sized country is going to need all the friends it can get. Thank you.